soul of what's wrong with me. I'm making like a man on a fuzzy tree. My friends say I'm acting wild as a bug and won't budge. Uh, I'm all stopped up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All stopped up. <laughs> Yeah, so that was the king, and we are going to start this uh, this our constipation. Episode. No, that was not the king. That was <laughs> that was me. Matt got hold on some kind of an iPhone karaoke <laughs> thing. That's right. I've made you stop calling me the king lately, right? <laughs> so yeah, we're we're going to get ourselves. Uh, Gosh, knee deep in the constipation, but um, it's a good place to start, probably with Elvis, the uh, one of the better known constip constipants. Is that a, is that a word um, in history, at least in modern history? Elvis had big time bowel issues. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you knew that, Rob, but um, no, yeah. So I've been, I've, as you know, I've been reading reading widely and broadly on constipation and stool over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been my uh, my personal task. Elvis had uh, had big time bowel issues. Um, I had recently read parts of a book. Where the author is Mary Roach, and she's written a, a couple different things on on the human body. They're really kind of scintillating. But uh, this this book is called Gulp: Adventures on the Alimentary Canal, and she actually interviewed Elvis's physician and, and spent time specifically talking about about Elvis's bowel habits, which apparently were were just God awful from the standpoint of his suffering through years and years of constipation. His doc, Dr. George Nicopolis, has a picture of Elvis's colon that he carries around with him um, from autopsy, and it was apparently two to three times normal size colon. So Elvis really was a was a hurting guy when it came to his his bowel habits. The presumption is that Elvis died of a cardiac arrhythmia, and that's what's listed on his death certificate. And in theory, this occurred as a result of him having to strain so much past his bowel movements. When when you strain, you create, as as you well know, Rob, and all the other pediatric providers out there, you create a valsalva maneuver, and a valsalva maneuver typically will decrease your heart rate and decrease your blood pressure. And if you do it for a long enough period, then especially if you're somebody like Elvis, who who was already walking around with a bad ticker, apparently it threw uh, threw his heart into chaos that day. And he passed away from it. So uh, constipation had been a long, lifelong struggle for Elvis. Um, and he, at least according to Dr. Nicopolis, had had to use enemas and laxatives on, on almost a daily basis. Okay, you told me you had a surprise cold opening on constipation. <laughs> yeah, I did you like not that? Get, I did uh -huh. like that. I did uh -huh. not know it was constipation. You through me singing there. Uh -huh. oh, I've been so excited to tackle uh, constipation. And as Matt said, he's been reading lots of books on constipation and poop in general and We'll touch base on potty training, but what I like about constipation in pediatrics is that we, the frontline pediatric caregivers, can intervene early in childhood and can prevent years of suffering. I don't know if Elvis had a pediatrician back in the day who was looking into this, but maybe they could have avoided it for Elvis too. And that's what we should do best as pediatric caregivers is prevent problems, do preventative medicine. Yep, that's our bag, and uh, it's a shame Elvis maybe... Yeah, could have had that looked into. I, I'm sure that all the uh, all the opiates didn't help either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the other point that was made in this book was um, he was notorious for having this really opulent or these really opulent bathrooms. Right, I read that <laughs> with televisions and, and telephones, and it kind of makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> that was his main room. Yeah, he spent some. Sounds like he spent an awful lot of time in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so what we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to lay down some basics first. So we're going to talk about what is poop, why is it called this, all these types of things. So we're going to launch right into getting some information out to, to our listeners. So what's poop made of is probably a good question, and most people probably aren't all that familiar with the nitty-gritty of this. But about 75% of the average bowel movement is water. This can really range relatively widely, though, as, as you can imagine. The water content of diarrhea is much higher and the, the amount of water in bowel movements that have been retained, uh, either voluntarily or, or otherwise, is lower. Water is absorbed out of fecal material as it passes through the intestine. So the longer bowel movement hangs around, then, of course, the drier it is. So 75% is water, and the other 25% of feces, uh, about a third of that 25%, is composed of dead bacteria. These come from the intestinal you know, jungle or garden or whatever we want to refer to as that microorganism soup 
that helps us to digest our food and which may have other purposes as well. And, and we hope to cover that in another episode. Rob has alluded to the fact that I have a fascination with a microbiome. And I think we have more bacteria in our body than cells in our body. We're basically skin yeah. and bone sacs carrying around bacteria. That's a lot of bacteria <laughs> and poop. poop. So, and it's not just bacteria. There are viruses and archaea in there as well. Um, so it's, it, it is definitely a mix. So a third of it's dead bacteria. The other third is uh, one third of it's made up of food that we can't really digest, most these things like cellulose and other types of things that are considered to be fiber. And then the last third of consists of the live bacteria that are uh, so helpful for us routinely, dead cells uh, from the intestinal lining and mucus from the intestinal lining, and a mixture of other components, things like cholesterol and inorganic salts and proteins. There are, as you can imagine, all, all different ways to refer to, to poop. Some of the uh, the typical ones, bowel movements, feces, stool, poop, we're all familiar with, but some of the more colorful names that I stumbled across when I was doing my research here, butt bombs, Lincoln Logs, colon cobras. Yeah, you, what, what did you call it when you were growing up? We called it duty. Duty? That's yeah. what I remember growing up. I'm not saying now. We called, it, we called it duty. You know, in the office, often when I say things like, stool the parents don't always know what i'm talking about and uh -huh. i always think that i didn't go to medical school and residency <laughs> seven years to say duty all day in the office and plus when i do say something like duty the kids just repeat it <laughs> over and over again and the parents don't appreciate it especially it, if they're like five and six year old boys oh, who are exactly. just scatology is their middle name man anything that has to do with poop they are just in blissville you know and it also goes to other things we're supposed to the guidelines are to call anatomic parts what they're supposed to be called so i know the the party line is you know say vagina say penis don't uh -huh. don't just say other words for it because the kids should realize that these are just normal body parts right but you say penis uh -huh. in the office and then the kids are yelling penis 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 <laughs> penis and the kids are leaving the room going penis 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 and the mother gives you this look like thank you very much <laughs> not, for not that. who's their penis uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing so you called it duty at my house we called it poos and, and in retrospect i'm not sure if that meant poos like pooey ooze or poos like poo plural, but it was always, you know, I'd say that to my friends and they would mock me because it wasn't a term that was used in their houses, but uh, I'll, I'll have to check with my mom on that one. You know, why, why, why did we call it that? And was it indeed, you know, which one of those interpretations is the right one? And just another reason for your friends to mock you. That your mother no lack of you. reasons, yeah. So, so why is it called poop? Well, we looked this one up too, just to, just to be complete. So there's a book out there, it's called Origins, a short etymological Dictionary of Modern English. And, and according to this book, which was authored by Eric Partridge, poop comes from a Middle English word, poopin, or poppin, that originally meant fart. That was another word that we weren't allowed to use at our house, by the way. We had to say passing gas. Toot. Breaking wind, actually, was yeah. the big one at my house. Again, we'll probably cover that in a future episode. So the word came about because it was presumably the sound that one made when one passed gas. According to another author, uh, author of American slang, Robert Chapman, the word poop actually came into its current use somewhere around 1900 or so. So that gives us some grounding to, to move forward. It sure does. <laughs> Let's move forward. Backwards. So... Other fun facts about poop, which uh, I'm sure everybody's going to be interested in. Why does it stink? Well, it stinks due to products of those bacteria that we were mentioning a little while ago. So bacteria produce this smelly sulfur or nitrogen-rich organic compound mix. The organic compounds in there are, are indole and scatol. Is that, I wonder if that's where scat came from, scatology. I don't know. Mm. And mercaptans and the inorga inorganic gas hydrogen sulfide. These are the compounds that give intestinal gas its odor. So let me ask you a question, Rob. Who has stinkier poop, carnivores or herbivores? Carnivores. You are correct. Yeah, so, so meat-eating animals, meat is a protein that's associated with a higher degree of sulfides, and that reduces, results in smellier gas and smellier poop. And that's why the poop of dogs and cats, and I'm not sure. You've been on safari. I've not, but like, <laughs> big cats, I suppose. Um, smells, I didn't get out of the Jeep, so <laughs> no, I wasn't, wasn't smelling your poop. Not, not enough to smell the poop. Smells worse than the poop of herbivores, like, like cows and horses. I did not know that. Yeah, there you go. Why is poop brown, you ask? 
Uh huh. Well, let me tell why? you why poop is brown. <laughs> I didn't. Ask. I didn't ask. <laughs> the brown color comes mainly from bilirubin, and bilirubin uh, is a pigment that comes out of the breakdown of red blood cells in the liver and in bone marrow. A lot of bilirubin and its byproducts end up in the intestine, and then it undergoes some further changes caused by bacteria. And the color itself comes from iron, um, but the iron is in bilirubin, and that gives gives stool its brown color. I will say that Matt did give me a book to read from his collection called Poop Happened by Sarah Alby. And the most significant thing I took from that book is that everything smelled in history back in the day. <laughs> I mean, everybody just threw their poop all over the place. Before there was plumbing, the Thames River was a cesspool, <laughs> as was the Seine in Paris, and it caused cholera. If you go back in history, it's kind of a romantic thing to do. But the smell, and oh, then shit. it used to be thought of as a religious thing, never to bathe. King Henry, I think, bathed twice in his life. Hmm. The priests in the church basically said that bathing was sinful, so it was encouraged never to bathe. They never used soap. If they clean themselves, they often used urine to wow. do it. Anyway, that, that's, what, that's what I got out of this entire book, is that must it really have, stunk pretty right. in the past. Yeah. I want that <laughs> that's back, why they put perfume on each other all the time. <laughs> right. All right. So we covered why poop is brown, but what other colors are possible in poop? Well, as everybody knows, there, are, there isn't just your basic brown here. It's mostly shades of brown, but other colors can occur with either certain conditions or under certain circumstances. And especially it depends on diet and, and somebody's overall health. For example, if somebody has a, a gastric ulcer, and they have a high intestinal bleed that oftentimes it can produce tarry black poops. Melina. Melina, exactly. And and that's from the presence of partially digested blood. So when people tell me, you know, when patients' parents tell me that their child's bowel movement is black, I really try to push them like, do you mean black, black? Like, like true black, really black? Or do you just mean kind of on the darker side of brown? Because if indeed it's black, that's going to raise my antenna a little bit in terms of whether or not there's something else going on. And get them right in and hemocote that stool right away. You betcha. And then so bleeding in the lower intestine, oftentimes we'll see that as a consequence of either internal hemorrhoids, sometimes external hemorrhoids, which are a lot easier to identify, anal fissures, which is essentially a paper cut kind of a lesion um, as, a, as a bowel movement is passing through through the anus. Uh, sometimes it's hard or firm enough or sharp enough that it creates a little little paper cut type of a lesion there. So those types of things end up actually more often than not being um, producing red stool uh, or at least red in or around the bowel movement. Usually if it's on the out, outside, we're presuming that it's more of a, oh, a streak from, from passing over a lesion. Whereas if it's mixed within the bowel movement, then we start to wonder more about things along the lines of a polyp or a mechal diverticula or something that's a little bit higher up right and then how about the multicolored which yeah, multi those are the more oh, fun ones that, that's that's yeah. the crayon the crayola crayon yeah well, what did so, they eat so it's really not unusual for kids to have you know essentially like a veritable rainbow you know, of, <laughs> of colors in there and and more often than not it's from them consuming things that that just didn't get digested at least didn't get the the, the color digested out of them so a lot of the processed foods especially with all the uh, food colorings tend to make for some interesting um interesting poops absolutely on, and you know the other end did mm-hmm. you know that crayola crayon just Got rid of one of their colors. Yes. Wait a minute. You remember I did, what it is? I did. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't, don't tell me. Was it uh, the dandel- plant? Dandelion right. yellow. Dandelion yellow. Yeah, but what did they add? They, they didn't. Something. They didn't say yet. They're, they're oh, stretching it out. That's right. It's, it's going to be, be in, the, ba- in the blue family. Ooh. And then you wonder who's out there <laughs> on pins and needles. You know, desperate to know what color Crayola is going to. And how pick. hard is it really to create colors? I mean, don't you just like add a little more or something? Or and a and I, less or something? I read this article. I think they have yellow, green, and they also have green, yellow. You'd think that right. that would have been high on the list of uh, colors uh, yeah. to cut. Yeah. But but we digress. Uh-huh. Um, so so some, some things will, although they're nonspecific, sometimes um, certain conditions or foodstuffs will make a child's poop green. And green seems to be a particularly freakish color when parents are trying to interpret it. Yeah, there's nothing they special about that. They get stuck on the con. Like, yeah. as long as it's not blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if it's not chalk white, which you were going right. to say, I right, think right, that right. rarely yeah. Yeah. liver issues and such. Yeah, so I was I was always taught that um, there are only three colors that you really need to worry about based on the color and not on other aspects of the history, and that is bright red, pitch black, and white. 
We already covered the color, covered the bright red and the pitch black, but white, so white to somebody who was trained in medicine at least needs to be investigated when you're not producing some of the liver substances that are supposed to be produced, right? Or it's blocked. Uh huh. Or, or, or there's a blockage in that whole hepatic system. Rob, do you see white stool, you know, often on the practice? Occasionally someone mentions it, yeah. and then I said, tell me if it doesn't go away, and it always goes away. It always goes away, <laughs> yeah. That, that, you're exactly right. I, you know, very infrequently do we i had i had one family just recently and so the first one that i've had in 20 some odd years who uh told me that the, no really the white bowel movements are pretty much an everyday basis and so we investigated the child's diet there was nothing really crazy about it and in the long run i ended up ordering some lfts everything was cool and uh his exam was completely innocuous so we didn't do anything else did it go away I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh-huh. you know, so one of the original things that attracted me to pediatric, even though I like constipation, but attracted me to pediatrics as opposed to like internal medicine, is that I wouldn't have to deal with chronic things like constipation. Right. I wouldn't have a Mrs. Huffnagel in my practice Ooh, with chronic dropped constipation. I dropped. There. You got that? Oh, I did. You know, for those listeners out there who don't recognize that name, a notorious pain in the butts of the <laughs> staff of St. Elsewhere. Uh-huh. Mrs. Yes. Huffnagel hat was an ongoing character. From with Fiscus and Boomer, uh-huh. um, I I know I think it was in med school during that show. I loved that. Um, that was my favorite show for the longest. Except time. I did not like the ending. It, it did have that boy who was I think the first. Well, we don't autistic, give away the ending, and I won't. Well, it was yeah. the first autistic character in a main TV show, I think, and it was done mm-hmm. in retrospect, I think, done really, really well. Right. But the finale kind of centered around that, and it just didn't See, work for me. I love me. that, though. Is this a really cool twist at the end? The first <laughs> episode had Dr. Altshuler, who was dying of liver cancer. And like seven scenes later, he was still, <laughs> still dying of liver around, cancer. Yeah. So, so all you Netflix fans out there, yes. hopefully you can find this there or on Amazon. This is a series worth watching. It is astounding, though, how many constipated kids are out there Everywhere. I often think there should be a telethon or something for constipation, maybe <laughs> hosted by Louis C.K. Like I would I would give to that. Louis C.K. hosting a constipation telethon addressing this major health issue. Constipation costs over three point eight billion dollars a year for adults and children, including having over a million constipated kids and Constipation in kids is on the rise, perhaps fueled by rising obesity, decreased exercise, poor fluid intake, sleep deprivation, and poor fiber in the diet. So yes, now we, the podcast pediatricians, Rob Walter and Matt Gotthold, take on all things constipation and poop. You can subscribe to Podcast Pediatricians on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and rate us on iTunes if you like. Like us on Facebook. Send us your pearls and faux pas to podcastpetricians.com. And again, tell us if you hate the beeper sound effect like Matt does. We'll be right back. So we both felt that we had to take a minute to salute one of the main sources of information for podcast pediatricians, and that's the media, especially print journalism. In an era where people are throwing around terms like fake news and alternative facts, both of us feel very strongly that a bedrock, uh, a foundation of a free society is a free press. So we salute the hardworking and mostly underpaid journalists and editors and publishers who are trying to adjust to the new economic realities and getting unjustly maligned. Special and specific thanks go to the medical health and science reporters from which we swipe many of our topics and great pediatric aggregators like Doximity, AAP Daily Briefing, New England Journal of Medicine Journal Watch, MedPage Today, Physicians First Watch. Please read the bibliographies for each show that are included and the links to these articles on podcastpediatricians.com. So I love newspapers. It's hard to get through my day without reading at least one newspaper, if not two or more, when I include the ones online, and I pay for them. From my early days of the Long Island Press, starting with Nancy and Sluggo and Dondi. Remember Dondi? I do. And Pogo. And Pogo. Yeah. What, what, what did he say? I never understood Pogo. I was little. No, I was too. Oh. But, uh, what was we have that seen. Quote? We have seen. We, we have met the enemy and he is us. Something like that? Yes, yeah, that was, exactly. That was a classic Pogo quote. I was a, what was your favorite when you were growing up? Initially, Nancy and Sluggo. And, really? then, and then went to Peanuts. 
Uh huh. How about Bazooka Joe? Did you dig Bazooka Joe when you got the gum? Just in the gum. Yeah, yeah. Just in the gum. I, I don't think he was ever in the in the newsprint. My favorite was. You know what? I, th- I thought the family circle was amusing initially. Uh-huh. And then I, that was before I worked my way into Doonesbury. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll get to that. So, you know, Newsday uh, was after Long Island Press, and there was a guy named Marvin Kitman who did What Else the TV things. I love that. And then started getting to the far side, oh, Calvin yeah. Hobbes. Oh, yeah. And the sports section, the New York Islanders and New York Nets. By the way, Dr. J is a, is a net. And he's a sixer, baby. And Tug McGraw is a net. 76ers. Sorry. My seventh grade social studies teacher, Mrs. Neenstead, insisted that Watergate in seventh grade would be the seminal event in our country. And every day she made us discuss articles on Watergate for the New York Times. And I was not happy. I'd rather read sports at the time, but I do appreciate the gift she gave me now. And I still love the Times every day. And their health and science reporting is cutting edge. The only problem is they don't have any comics. Yeah. But otherwise, it's a perfect paper. That I've uh, I've recently started listening to because I get it with my Audible subscription to the Wall Street Journal. Completely different take on on things. Yep. Obviously, I like it because my my leanings tend to be a little bit more New York Timesy, and the Wall Street Journal kind of fills in some of the gaps. So I, I've worked my way up to the Saturday Wall Street Journal, but there you uh, go. I got to uh-huh. go more. You know, I was in Chicago for ten years, and a guy named Mike Royko was a famous columnist who was great, and he covered the '85 Bears. There was also something called the Chicago Reader. I don't know if Philly has an underground paper, but it had Life in Hell, Matt Groening, the guy who ended up doing The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. And Zippy the Pinhead, uh-huh. which I never understood. Yeah, um, didn't all Matt Groening's initial uh, people look kind of like Marge, but with ears? Or yes. Something? Like bunnies, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. It was great. And I was in D.C. for a bit, and the Washington Post is the best political coverage of anything. I do have a love-hate relationship a little bit with our local paper, the News Journal here in Wilmington. It's a Gannett USA Today paper, but I love their local news and grudgingly admit that Gannett does bring some better national sports and arts coverage that I would have gotten in the purely local paper before. If only, uh, if only the folks at the News Journal would learn how to use their spell check, I'd be a lot happier. Yeah, Matt really does not like... Uh, irritates that. And, and really, there is no better way to be connected to your community than reading your local newspaper. So support your local newspaper, please. So with the ending of Foxtrot and For Better or For Worse, we only have Zitz, Doonesbury, Dilbert, and Peanuts reruns left to read in the comics. I think it's a pretty poor state of comics. I'm sure there's a big burgeoning comics online that I don't read, but right. the newspaper comics are just not what it used to be. Do you, do you read magazines? Oh, yeah. What do you read? I read, let me see here, a lot a lot of my, it's a pretty eclectic mix. So I'll go anywhere from um, from time to ink and fast company, entrepreneur. So a lot of these things are kind of, you know, based on me trying to learn a little bit more about being a small businessman. But, um, you know, I will certainly dabble in National Geographic. I enjoy the Atlantic. I think you're a tiny, you're already a mm-hmm. tiny small yeah. businessman. Yeah. Again, uh, <laughs> I do not like the business side of things. So I, I, I read Sports Illustrated. Uh-huh. Not just a swimsuit edition, as I tell my right. patients. <laughs> Do also time. I, I used to read Newsweek. I miss them. They they had this section at the end called My Favorite Mistake, and our faux pas is a little bit based on that. Um, the New Yorker, more for its reviews and talk of the town and humor than the fiction. I have to admit I don't really get through the fiction. I used to get The Economist, mm-hmm. but it's just so dense with information. It, is, it just yeah, would be on my, my desk and pile up. So unfortunately, I stopped doing guilty. that. Yeah, I have. There were huge piles. Well, you were just over to my house. There were huge piles. <laughs> <laughs> That's right a bit of a chair. book hoarder. <laughs> I am. I'm a hoarder, especially, you know, particularly with books or anything, uh, anything I can read. And my guilty, guilty, guilty reading pleasure is Entertainment Weekly, which is like getting a Hanukkah present every week in my mailbox. Um, what's not a big source of news for me, and I don't know about you, what's not a big source for me is television. No. Except maybe Sator, like The Daily Show, SNL, and its spinoffs, but TV news is not. It's, you know, I, I, I kind of enjoy every once in a while, at least once a week, just flipping between the major channels and just seeing the disparity in, in their reporting. It's really, um, you know, it, I think it goes back to what we started with. Thank God for the free press, right? right. So, so we've got all these views out there and it's up to us to kind of sort through them and try to decide how they impact our lives. And I agree with you. Mm-hmm. And if you have one set of view, you should occasionally look at another. I'll sure. read the Wall Street mm-hmm. Journal. 
I'll watch some of the news right. stations that are not my usual things every once in a while. Uh, well, you know, I've always tried to teach my kids that the way to mount a cogent argument is to understand both sides. And you, ha- and you should understand your, you know, for lack of a better, better word, your opponent's side as well, if not better than they do, in order to make your argument more cohesive and more optimal. Completely agree. We'll be right back. We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child and their situation. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. So we're going to move on now and discuss a little bit uh, of background here on the anatomy of the colon. So in general, the human colon is not just a big old tube, but it's a very dynamic organ with a variety of functions. I usually tell my parents and the patients that I see who are old enough to understand it that the colon really only has two jobs. The first is to serve as a place to store our solid waste until it's convenient for us to defecate, essentially so we're not leaking all day long. And the second is to resorb water so we don't get dehydrated or need to constantly drink. So essentially the colon largely is recycling water. This statement is true for the most part, although the colon also absorbs electrolytes and salvages some unabsorbed nutrients as well. You tell your patients that they might be leaking all day long? Well, I kind of, I I have them create that picture in their mind. (laughs) So in other words, the colon's a good thing. That's a great picture. Uh Oh, yeah, it's kind of nasty. Go Um, on. Go on. (laughs) Okay. Although it's not absolutely essential for life, the colon still plays major roles in human health and well-being. In fact, there for a while in the, I believe it was the late 1800s, there was a real trend, especially in England, to treat women who were presumably very predisposed to having constipation and all the ills that uh, it was equated with at that point, to actually have them have colectomies. There was a very famous surgeon who would routinely do what were essentially essentially elective colectomies. Oh, my God. So kind of along the same lines of, my neighbor got Botox, so I'm going to get Botox. (laughs) But instead, it was more along the lines of, (laughs) Jane had a colectomy, so I want one now. Really crazy stuff. In the pre-antibiotic era, so they probably... Yeah, so so a lot of these folks didn't, didn't even survive. But yeah, it was this guy's theory that there were actually kinks in the colon, flexures, that uh, that really mitigated the appropriate passage of bowel movements. The constipation, et cetera, has been treated by all wacky kind of ways over the, over the centuries. The intestine in general is a, is a mobile organ. Altered motility is thought to play a role in various types of GI disorders. Um, transit time can vary a lot. Uh, depending on where you live in the world and what what culture you're part of. In the West, transit time usually averages about 53 hours. And how they came up with that, I'm sure, was very scientific. And that's because much of our diet consists of processed foods and low fiber. Whereas in other parts of the world, there's a much shorter uh, transit time. And it's shorter due to their diets. On average, of that transit time, about 75% of it is time spent in the colon. So this leads us into what's normal. What's normal, Rob? So stool should be in the colon. (laughs) Stool belongs in the colon. That's right. Um, I support that. (laughs) Until it's not. So infants can go as often as with every feeding initially. And then at times they will stretch it out into golly, you know, once a week, maybe even further out for infants. When is going to the bathroom a problem in terms of how often you go? Well, it's a problem, as, as one of my GI professors told me, it's a problem when it's a problem. Meaning that for the most part, unless a child is struggling with anything or it's presenting itself as a compromise to their health, then there's a wide variability in how often kids go to the bathroom. This is true of somebody who's healthy and who's thriving and who isn't struggling. However, when one gets to the point where it is becoming an issue, then we start to get a little bit more specific in terms of how often we would like to see somebody stool. So the causes for constipation range all over the place. Everything from a diet, which we just alluded to, to pharmacology. Certainly, you know that folks who have issues with opiates tend to have more of a problem with their bowels in terms of it starting to slow down their bowel. Which leads be... to all the yeah. opioid-associated constipation commercials yes. at, the, at the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know the it was Super a Bowl until I got to hear. Oh, about you know it what? Wait a minute. Check this out. Check this out. So, so, so in a minute, we'll talk about the various ways that people refer to going to the bathroom. But my personal favorite is dropping the Browns off at the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I think my brother told me that one. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> it's, it's a the classic. Bra- Browns have never sniffed a Super Bowl. Uh, 
there is an entire industry now based on the fact that we have uh, drugged our population into bowel stasis with a lot of the opioids that we are using these days. Lots of people become constipated due to both diet and lifestyle neglect. You know, here in the U.S., fiber intake is extremely low compared to other parts of the world. Two primary roles of the colon, again, solidifying the chyme into stool and then eventually defecating. And that goes along with the, you know, essentially dehydrating the stool to an extent. Both are really largely dependent on dietary fiber. Dietary fiber is considered to normalize the large bowel function. And largely that is um, part and parcel of the type of microbiology that exists in the large bowel. Okay, before we get into true constipation in older kids, let's start at the very beginning of infrequent pooping with newborns and young infants. Now, newborn poop is called meconium. It's dark and sticky and transitions to brown and then more to the runny, green, yellow, normal baby stool. A special category of constipation is when it occurs in the first few weeks. A general rule of thumb is that any breastfed newborn or young infant that passed newborn meconium poop nicely in the first few days and then is not pooping much is just not getting enough breast milk until proven otherwise. And that just always seems to hold true. So what is meconium, Rob, Walter? What's it made out of? Black, sticky, <laughs> nasty, tarry, tarry. Nasty stuff. Yeah, it's, I was always taught that it's a consequence of what the baby swallows while they were in the womb, including all the skin that's shedding because it's a constant and kind of dynamic process. So again, if a breastfed newborn is not pooping, they're not getting milk. Unless, rarely, it's not because of that. Sometimes there can be true anatomic issues like a bowel obstruction from atresia where the intestine did not get enough blood flow and it ends in a blind pouch or something called a meconium plug where the meconium is extra, extra thick and gets stuck. In that case, think cystic fibrosis. Also, there's children who are just not born with an anus. That happens. And so in the it newborn does. exam, yeah. you got to look for the anus. Another yeah. uncommon condition to think of is something called Hirschsprung's disease. That's when part of the distal colon does not have the normal nerve endings. And so the bowel cannot push the poop out normally with muscle contractions called peristalsis. Now, Hirschsprung's classically presents as delayed passing of early newborn sticky black meconium until after 48 hours. However, up to 10% of newborns with Hirschsprung's will pass it under 24 hours. And about half of kids with Hirschsprung's will pass it in 48 hours. So we still have to think about it in older babies who have difficulty pooping, even if they pass meconium at a reasonable time. So, so what happens if you don't pick up on Hirschsprung's? You ask all kinds of nasty things, really. Oh, I thought right? that was a joke you uh -huh. were starting. Oh, no, 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 no. no so no. short segment Hirschsprung's mm -hmm. could go on for years. I had a patient in uh, my residency days who was... 10 or 11, and it just turned out the mother gave the kid an enema every Friday hmm. since he was born, pretty much, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. never presented with this short segment uh, Hirschbrunn's until the mother finally stopped giving the child an enema. Wow. In older times, this condition was not diagnosed for a long time, and sometimes it presented with a huge megacolon, but these days you rarely see that, like the one that's in Philadelphia's own Mutter or Mutter Museum of Medical Oddities. Yeah, so there is a patient up there referred to as JW. So JW's colon is in the, I prefer to say, Mutter Museum in Philly, because I grew up in Philly, out just outside. So this is a huge case. This is probably the biggest colon in the history of mankind. So this colon, the width of his colon <laughs> is 28 inches wide <laughs> at its most distended, which is like, you know, is like a pair of pants. So it's waist size for a thinner person. Normal colons themselves are about three inches wide. So, I mean, shoot, do the math there. It's like nine times wider than a normal colon. That's crazy. So, so this guy, this poor JW guy, was actually hired by, at that point, what was referred to as, unfortunately referred to as a freak show that was stationed at Ninth, Ninth and Art. He was advertised as the balloon man. <laughs> and they essentially had him display his, his big old belly up on stage, which obviously must have been pretty impressive. I mean, people paid to see it. And he eventually and probably um, mercifully died at the age of 29. Uh, 
Sad, sad story. Oh, my gosh. You, if you ever have the chance to go to Philadelphia, swing right. by the Mooter. Okay, so if you're planning a mm-hmm. family vacation with your children, maybe not too young, I heartily recommend <laughs> And, and you're part of the Adams family. <laughs> <laughs> to the Mooter Museum, one of my favorite museums right near Rittenhouse Square. It's got the soap lady, a rather obese woman who, through a series of events when she died, her the fat turned into soap. It has President Grover Cleveland's malignant tumor. It's got brain slices from Albert Einstein. It's got thousands of foreign bodies taken from the throat and lungs of Philadelphia area children and adults over a century. Nice. And it has more skulls than the Capuchin Vault in Rome. So <laughs> Is that where they have all those skulls? Got stacked? Yes, I was oh, there. It's, I've never been to it's, Rome. It's I've really seen pictures. cool. So, wow. And someday when we're going over our favorite books, uh, one of them will be Dr. Mutter's Marvels. Dr. Mutter himself, or he liked to call himself Mutter, was amazing. He was the first true plastic surgeon. Philadelphia was the center of American medicine. But it also goes over, A, how racist Philadelphia was back then. <laughs> it also Every talks about was. how, especially at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Mutter helped found Jefferson. But at Pennsylvania, others, they didn't believe in anesthesia for surgery when ether came out. They also <laughs> didn't believe in the germ theory, especially delivery. A lot of newborns died of infection. and. Wow. In Boston, where they did believe more in anesthesia and did believe in the germ theory and washed their hands more, they uh, kind of took over the mantle for uh, American huh. medicine. But it's all in that book. What's the uh, you mentioned racism? What was what was especially pronounced with that? Well, it was really pronounced as that Pennsylvania was the first state, I believe, to pass a law like in 1780 that said that slavery was wrong, mm-hmm. and it was the first kind of pro-abolition law. They also just continued really racist and segregated policies well into. Hmm. A decade or two before the Civil War. So right. slaves continued. Only the children of slaves could possibly be free. And even then it was difficult. Hmm. So wow. I've always had learned, well, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was a leader because of the Quakers. Great little freedom. The yeah. Quakers were a real uh, center for abolition. But the city of Philadelphia uh, didn't always follow that. And yeah. more than half the medical students in the city of Philadelphia came from the South. Mm. So when the Civil War came, more than half of them went to uh, fight and do surgery for the Confederate Army. And it's also another really interesting story. Interesting. That book should mm-hmm. be made into a movie. Dr. Moody. Is all himself, that in the book? It's all in the book. Oh, cool. But he was a flamboyant person who was way ahead of his time, very liberal thinking, very much taught that you had to listen to the patient in an era where most it was of like, the big doctors I'm a were, doctor, you're not kind of stuff. Don't yeah. touch mm-hmm. the patient. Don't get to wow. know the patient. Don't get personally involved. So he died tragically at 46 years old or 48 years old. Wow. Um, it was real sad because he was a giant of, uh, of medicine. Dr. Thomas Dent Mooder. Hmm. Okay. Check that out. Very good. Okay. We, we've gone back. So, so, so this, we're all about the tangents yes. around here. So, so this Hirschsprung mm-hmm. is usually diagnosed with the barium enema and then definitively diagnosed with a scope and biopsying the bowel to look for the absence of those nerves, and then treated with surgery to get rid of the non-working bowel. Not like taking out the entire colon of women in the 1880s in England. Yes. In England. Because it was cool. Now, another poop-related issue I've seen over the years in infants, but not really seen described much, is young infants with a tight anal ring. These parents of these young babies complain that their babies strain with every stool, although they do go at least daily, and the stool is usually liquidy and often explosive when it comes out. And then the child is happy again until it builds up again. The exam is always fine, and they're always growing okay. When I hear that story, I usually do a gentle rectal exam with my glove pinky, although I know gentle rectal <laughs> probably doesn't seem like it should go in the same sentence. Bit of an oxymoron. And I feel this tight anal ring, and often I have learned over time to get out of the way, because often when I first go in, the poop just shoots across the room. Just doing this once back and forth usually seems to stretch it enough that I don't need to do it again, although occasionally it recurs. I'm always worried that I might be missing a very short segment Hirschsprungs, but then they seem to be okay, and the moms are so happy saying that mm-hmm. that just cured it. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. I have. I have 
you know, seen a handful of kids like this. I actually had a case where I think the child was 11 or 12 months old. And up to that point, at least, and I, and I went back and checked my note, there had never been a concern about uh, constipation or any bowel issues. And then I believe it was at the nine month old visit or so that the mom mentioned, oh, you know, he's still constipated the way he usually is. And that kind of got me to prick up my ears because I didn't know that he had been. And then we started to talk about how, he, how the child, uh, how often the child went. It wasn't very often. It seemed very straining. It seemed to be thin ribbons. And so I, I went to do a, a rectal exam on the baby, you know, gently, you know, with a gloved finger that was, uh, that had a little bit of Vaseline on it. And lo and behold, I encountered this really thick ring. And this baby really had what essentially was an obstruction right inside of their anal area and had, had been essentially defecating through this relatively small space. You know, of course, immediately we referred him on the surgery and that got taken care of. It was kind of a web. And, um, you yeah, know, the baby was thriving otherwise. So it's, it's incredible how people can oftentimes live with things that would seem like they're really prohibitive to health and just, you know, continue to exist until it gets addressed. Right. Now, that seems to be even mm-hmm. a more severe example of what yeah. I'm talking about. Mine is a more routine thing. I do right. it once or dump. I always imagine what you've described in terms of the, you know, just using your pinky to essentially dilate a little bit on a one-time basis, kind of similar to what the GI folks will do if somebody has achalasia. Exactly. A restriction of the esophagus, they will pass kind of incre- you know, increasingly larger and you know, more or less weighted dilators. Yes, and for significant anal stenosis, more than what I'm talking about, pediatric surgeons can use the same kind of instrumentation without surgery to gradually dilate the anus over time and fix the problem without surgery. So we heard your feedback on show length, and we're going to wrap it up right here. But stay tuned for the next two of three-part Poopalooza. Did you just say Poopalooza? Poopalooza. You're a (laughs) Poopalooza. That's what she said. (laughs) I was waiting. How many episodes we go before... Matt's inner David Brent came out, and he he used that term. I've been I've been curbing myself. <laughs> Next up, part two: the Miralax controversy, and we get into the meat of constipation. Say goodbye, Matt. <laughs> goodbye, Rob. Well, bless my soul, what's wrong with me? I'm itching like a man on a fuzzy tree My friends say I'm acting wild as a bug I'm in love, I'm all shook up Ooh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah Podcast Pediatricians Productions, all rights reserved.